a very well-known author. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let him say more about some of his work. But Phil, Phil spent a lot of time with Joseph Campbell. And Phil is kind of carrying the, the mantle, the mythology mantle, and the hero's journey mantle. Uh, and he's, he's just really, really the man when it comes to uh, the journey. And he's going to talk about, we're going to take a little bit of a different tack here. We're going to go into the world land of mythology and legends and journeys. <coughs> and, and Phil, I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you. Yeah. Here. Good morning, everybody. Okay, Phil, wait, let me line this up here. You go ahead and start okay. talking, and I'll get you all set. Um, this is my 12th talk in 12 days on 12 different topics. Uh, so bear with me if I get a little mumbled. Um, l last night, I, I finished shooting a, a program for PBS, and I got home, and I, I realized I had to gather my thoughts together. What am I going to talk about? And I remembered something one of my favorite writers, James Thurber, said, I don't know what I think until I read what I have to say. So I started putting my notes together, and I was still wondering, what tech can I take? I'm, I don't know nearly as much as anybody in this room about sweats and saunas. Can't pretend that I do. I've been taking them since I was a boy. Traveled all over Europe. Many saunas there. I've done six films on Native American issues and in every film project we always initiated every day of shooting with a sweat of some kind and sweat lodge and so on. And yet that's still not my entry. The entry is the journey. Ne next slide. Mark. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> What's a journey? A journey is a voyage of discovery. Not all journeys, the great journey, the true journey is voyage of discovery and transformation. This is me as a little boy reading as my, a magazine upside down as my father's taking a photo of me and I distinctly remember trying to impress him that I'm reading at three years old. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's a deep bone DNA memory. And so I... My, I've been traveling all my life, and recently I asked my mom, why do you think I've been obsessed with traveling and journeys? And she said, well, it's because you were born in a, an army hospital, Fort Jackson, Columbia, South Carolina, and two days later we put you into the 1949 Hudson and drove to Detroit where I grew up. And she said, there must have been something in that ride that made you obsessed with travel. And I've been traveling really ever since, and I see everything as a journey. Growing up, I saw the, the trajectory of a baseball at Tiger Stadium in Detroit as a journey. Every book I read, we read books out loud Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night in our house in Detroit. So I grew up steeped in stories. We went to art museums. I saw every painting as a journey, the journey of a vision, the journey of the artist, him or herself. Every journey. This is a journey of the oldest road in the world. For those of you who want to know, do you know where this is? This is the road outside of the Palace of Knossos on Crete. I was just there again last summer, and my guide, a great a Cretan guide, pointed and said, oh, incidentally, this is the oldest road in the world. And that stirred something deep in me. And then that's what came up last night as I was thinking about our talk today. Every trip to the sauna, every experience of a sweat is a journey. Here I am at 29 years old meeting my hero, the mythologist Joseph Campbell. You can see the paint specks in my hair because I've been house painting all day in San Francisco. And when I, five years later, I got the chance to write the movie about his life, The Hero's Journey, which is still playing on TV after 25 years. And I remember one of the first things that Joe said to me was that Yes, everything is a journey, and it's because all of us human beings are fascinated by one thing, how things change, how people change. And every journey needs a story. So I'm going to re go through just a couple brief ones to set up this idea of the sun as a journey. Here, of course, is the blind poet Homer playing a harp. The, the idea was that the Iliad and the Odyssey were never written down. They were told, and they were always told to music. What story would he told? 
he told one of the first stories about the fire in the mind of the hero. All heroes' journeys of every kind begin in the mind. We are inspired to go somewhere in search of a treasure, to solve a problem, to transform yourself or your tribe or your people. This is Odysseus contemplating. Can you see how this bust was made? You can see the wrinkles in his head. It's a magnificent depiction of thought itself. He is contemplating this challenge. Will you gather together with the 10,000 ships to go to Troy to save Helen and so on and so on? At the beginning of all these adventures, you'll notice the, the, the changes, the stages will become recognizable to you. <coughs> you can you take the call. Not all people accept the call to adventure. Some say, I'm going to stay home and, and be a couch potato. I'm going to refuse the call. Those are people who are, what well, Joe once told me, um, those are people who get stuck later on in life in a midlife crisis. They've climbed to the top of the ladder and it's leaning against the wrong wall. <laughs> that means you haven't taken the call. <laughs> and every call, though, you need a mentor of some kind because it takes tremendous courage to actually pursue a dream, to solve a problem, to transform and change your life in some way. And in a wonderful notion, I, was, I wrote a whole chapter on the mentor, the power of the mentor in a book. Found it, it comes from the old Greek mind maker. Mentor was actually a friend of Odysseus. And when he went off to war, he said, Mentor, that was his best friend. Will you take care of my son while I'm away at war? And I've used this as a model ever since. And I'm going to pull all this together. The mentor is the one who helps you make up your own mind. We, we already heard a couple of wonderful par parables this morning about mentorship. Mickle needed a mentor to pursue his book and then the dream of this sauna. This conference, the summit, needed a mentor. If you pursue that dream, that quest on any kind of journey, you will tend to fall, find kindred spirits. <laughs> I think we now yeah. have found 60 kindred spirits, right, in this journey together about the mystery of the sweat, the mystery of the sauna. If you keep going on a quest, see, this is going to come deliciously together, every journey goes through an underworld. There is a battle, there is an ordeal, or it's not an adventure. It's not a journey, it's a ride to Disneyland. <laughs> the ordeal, of course, here is the war at Troy. And after 20 years, as you know the story, 10 years of fighting, 10 years to get home, Odysseus here walks back into Ithaca, a changed man. His relationship to himself, his relationship to Penelope, his wife, is forever transformed. This is one of the great mysteries of drama. That's why I feel every journey to a sauna is a mini drama. We are restless. We need, I love what you, what you were saying about how you, you find a time to be contemplative in the sauna. This is where the great change takes place. We're tense and we go somewhere to take a breath and relax. This is why it's a journey. Another form of this journey, I found out, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Art of Pilgrimage because I heard that in the, in the year 2000, Travel became the number one business in the world. It actually surpassed the armaments industry. It is now the number one business in the world, and it's partially fueled by a tremendous research and pilgrimage. And I don't mean just the pious monk walking all the way to Jerusalem, right? I mean all kinds of pilgrimage, including literary pilgrimage. A pilgrimage out of respect, a journey of respect to the house of James Joyce or Anna Muck. Uh, Maktova uh, in, uh, in St. Petersburg? Mm. Akhmatova, thank you, thank you. I'm trying to bring Russia in on this. Or, as I do, to uh, Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. Journeys of respect. Mm. This, this is a journey I took with my family to go to the roots of where the Cousineaus began in, in uh, upstate Canada. Why a pilgrimage? As opposed to the fire in the mine, you take a pilgrimage, a journey of respect, a kind of rebirth, to rekindle your spirit or your soul. It's a different kind of journey. Something is lacking. Your therapist can't help you anymore. Your best friend, Mickle, down at O'Reilly's Pub in North Beach, can't help me anymore. You take the pilgrimage to revive your spirit. It begins with a kind of longing. 
after I went to a University of Detroit and studied in journalism, I told my college girlfriend, I'll be back in three months. I came back three years later. She wasn't around. But I felt this deep sense of longing. This is me climbing a palm tree on a kibbutz in Israel. I'm yearning. All pilgrimages, the soul journey, is a kind of yearning for some deep kind of change, either that day or in your life. All pilgrimages go through the sense of ordeal, a labyrinth. No ordeal, no labyrinth, no pilgrimage, no real journey. I've had I, I lead groups to Ireland, Greece, Turkey, many places around the world. And at least once a year, someone will call and say, um, I'd love to go on a pilgrimage with you, but does it have to be so hard? Uh, could we have one without so much walking and so much talking? <laughs> and say, uh, buy the video, please. <laughs> and at the, at the end of every great journey, every great pilgrimage, <clears throat> as this one, I was, I was shooting a film about the Comanche Indians, Quanta Parker, one of the many films I've done in Indian issues. You celebrate every end of a pilgrimage, a vision quest of some kind with a celebration. There, this is a powwow in, in Oklahoma. And what are you celebrating? You're celebrating a sense of change. Something has happened in your mind, your body, or your soul, and you signal it. You signal it because you are different. You feel revived, resuscitated, rejuvenated, sound familiar. Mm -hmm. All these re-words sound familiar in, in the sauna world. So, the third element here, mm. the fire in the body. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. There's a, there's a call. I'm restless. Uh, I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I haven't been taking care of my body. This is me as a house painter in San Francisco for seven years. The saunas in San Francisco were enormously important for me to keep my life alive, to keep my mind alive, and my whole dream of being a writer someday. And last night, I had an equivalent epiphany that Mikkel had. As I began to put just a handful of notes down, including uh, the idea, everybody knows the Edison quote, genius is 99% perspiration. <laughs> 1% inspiration. So the thought came to me, everybody that takes a sweat is a genius. <laughs> you can use it now. <laughs> and wanting to be geniuses, wanting to take care of ourselves, mind, body, and soul, we take a journey. If you drive across San Francisco, if you drive across Helsinki, you have actually begun a journey. You've closed the door and you've entered. There's always a stage of crossing a threshold in every hero's journey, but also in every pilgrimage. Threshold is this magical old word that describes the difference between the outer world and the inner world, the profane world and then the sacred world. And I, I love this. There's this. Did you feel this sense of respect mm. in this first talk? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name. Yeah, well that there is respect and there's a kind of reverence for that hour or two or three because there's a shift now. I cannot be the same vulgar guy I was at work today or last night. Mm. It's a respect for what's about to happen. Something is changing in you, mind, body, and soul. Oh. As oh, in works. every journey, <laughs> we need a mentor, right? Thank you. Mickle's book. Actually, books. Uh, Campbell once told me that, that James Joyce's books were enormous mentors to him. Sometimes the mentor is alive right in front of you. Mm. Often, it's a work of art, maybe a movie, a song. Van Morrison is a kind of mentor to me because his work takes me to another realm. Mm. Mickle's work, his book, has become a mentor for people involved and intrigued with this world. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And with every pilgrimage, every hero's journey, there are elements of ritual and ceremony. Why? Because there is a longing for real transformation, real change. Without the ritual, the ritual stoking of the bath here in Helsinki or in Native American tradition, you can still sweat, but there will be no significant change. With the Native Americans, for example, and I've done dozens of sweats with them, 
there was always this reminder of a sacrifice. And you know the origin of the word sacrifice? It means originally to make sacred. So sacrifice might just be in the form of money. You might have to pay $50 to have a good sweat. Think of it ritually or mythically as the sacrifice. You are now making that moment a little special, a little significant. All native people, sometimes you walk or you would f uh, fast before a sweat. In all the films that I did on these issues, we were, <clears throat> every time we had a film, different native people, I worked with 20 different tribes or nations across the country, they were saying, um, we have to signal the story you are about to tell with us and for us, Phil, because we need to make it sacred. So the pain you are about to endure <laughs> in the sweat, think of it as your offering for the change we're about to have here. Oh, that changed everything for me. The sacrifice, the pain, the labyrinth stage of a sweat. My mm -hmm. first bold experience of it was the famous, mm -hmm. can you pronounce it? Nope. <laughs> Anybody? Cal wait, wait, we have somebody in here. Cal the Calgary, Turkey, the Hamam in, uh, in Istanbul. <laughs> See? Oh. Say it again. Oh my God. Oh, it's, yeah, I, I would have slaughtered that. <laughs> Thank you. See, it's C-A-U-G-A. My, my first trip here, this goes back to the, yeah, yeah. to the 1600s. It's one of the most magnificent marble imams yeah. in the world. Yeah. And I went in just for a sense of revival. I've been traveling for months, and someone in Istanbul said, if you want to revive yourself, you need to to take an imam, go to the sweat. I had no idea that I was going to be pummeled the way that I was. It was a torture chamber for me. But I came out the other end, wow, I'm coming back tomorrow. But I've always thought of that as the equivalent of the ordeal. There's a little sacrifice. You have to endure a little bit of pain for that vision, right? <laughs> yes, thank you. And I've gone back ever since. Yeah. Following in the same really sweet formula of this, on a hero's journey, you meet. The hero cannot finish a real journey, a real quest alone. It's extremely narcissistic to think that you can do these, these deep quests on your own. So you meet fellow warriors, fellow heroes, and so on. On a pilgrimage, one of the great attractions in world history, from Aborigine vision quest 60,000 years ago to today, writers going to the house of Emily Dickinson, any kind of, you meet fellow travelers. And this is something that I have come to appreciate so much through Mikkel. It's this notion when you sit, and you slow down. Remember what Thoreau said, when in doubt, move slowly. That's almost heresy today, isn't it? <laughs> but that's what we are enjoining. When we sit together slowly, quietly, with our fellow travelers, then something magical can happen. What are we sweating? What is being released? If we had more time, we could probably follow one of Mikkel's sweat drops <laughs> on its long journey. <laughs> I don't know Next. about that. <laughs> we, we need a special camera. A special camera that. for that. Okay. Next so, slide. Can you work on that for the TV show? <laughs> so, I've been working with an archaeologist down in San Diego for the last few months. Talk, uh, do, he's doing research on the ultimate origins of the human race. It's very fascinating for me. Science isn't my, f my focus, but I've come to love the work I'm doing with him. And he said something amazing just in last week's interview. First, do you know the origin of the word focus? It's Latin for the fireplace. Take that in for a second. Human beings have been staring into fires for countless millennia. If you think of just the history that goes back to the Paleolithic caves, now 37, 41,000 years ago, I think in the Chauvet caves now, we, human beings, have been staring into fires for at least 100,000 years. And what do we do when we stare into a fire? We focus. That's where the word comes from. Isn't that glorious? And as we focus and make our fire, we are engaging in, as the scientist has just told me, in 
let's go back one more, if we can. Back to the origins, he said, fire, he, we have evidence of fire about 120,000 years ago, and he says the invention of fire was also the invention of conversation. Wait, do you mean invention or do you mean control? Control, yeah. con control fire, not just a happens, happenstance. Yeah. And that is a way Allen said in the opening to Annie Hall, total heaviosity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to quote the Latin. <laughs> just the, the idea that we were perhaps monosyllabic for a while, as we were only outdoors and life was very limited to the, the hours of the sun. When we began to gather together in close spaces like a sauna, we actually began to converse together. And this then becomes one of the glories of the sauna. It was the invention of fire. There's one of my dear mentors, Reuben Snake, who Houston Smith, a historian of religion, calls the American Indian Dalai Lama. That's the role that he held with American Indians. And just before he died, we had a sweat in honor of a film that I was making on peyote religion. Because peyote is the oldest known religion, and it was banned by the US Supreme Court in 1991. And a number of us gathered together, and we made a film with Reuben, and actually took it to Congress and overturned the Supreme Court decision with a documentary. It was about the freedom for American Indians. And one of the last things Reuben told me is, I'm a poor Indian, Phil, but I'm not an unhappy Indian. When I meet with my brothers and sisters in the sweat or the teepee, let's say in a prayer meeting, a peyote meeting, he says, and we talk story. Isn't that a fantastic phrase? You're talking, but we can all talk at each other, over each other. We can talk at the wall behind somebody. But when we talk story, we're actually communicating with each other, often in these sacred settings like a sweat. Then I'm the richest man in the world. And then I borrowed liberally again from Mickel's book here. And I love the notion that coming out of the sweat, coming out of the sauna, if that's the proper pronunciation, is an evocation of the gray ending of uh, T.S. Eliot's four quartet, quartets, if you recall. And the end of our, our exploring will be to arrive in where we started and know, I'm paraphrasing now, our bodies for the first time. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.